Dr. State Rep, you have been pointing to the inequities in the system for people of color and low income, and this discussion actually started with earnest with COVID. So have you seen any improvement, for example, in how ventilators are distributed, for example? Well, fortunately, we're in a place right now where infections, hospitalizations are going down, and I hope that over the course of the next couple of weeks, deaths will also go down as well. But there's no doubt throughout this past year that black and brown communities, they're significantly more likely to be infected and die from this. And so as we apportion vaccines and as we make sure testing is still readily available, we just have to make sure that we are being cognizant of the challenges that certain communities face, whether they're poor, whether they're elderly, or whether they're you know, minority uh, communities that have a mistrust in the American health care system. I was gonna ask you that. Is there, is there, is there a mistrust? Is there, there's a mistrust. Where's it's, the reluctance to, 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 to whatever, for services and vaccines? Well, it, it's been there for a very long time. I mean, you can look at the Tuskegee experience you can look at the sterilization of Puerto Rican women that have, has happened in this country. And so when I talk to my patients, I try to take an extra minute or two to make sure that they understand the importance of getting the vaccine, the importance of getting care. The only way out of this virus, this, this nightmare, is going to be through vaccination. And I think if we have a forward-facing approach and making sure those folks feel comfortable, engaged, and educated, then we will be successful. Um, I'm going to ask you to put your other hat on now. Um, you're a state legislator, and uh, there's a new sheriff or a new speaker <laughs> in town. Um, he's got a reputation of being a bit of old school, but says he's going to be much more transparent. He's going to include more progressive members, members like you, with more progressive ideas. Do you take him at his word, or is it wait and see on your part? Absolutely, and the proof is in the pudding. We just finished what I would argue is the most productive and progressive legislative session in recent history. And that's largely thanks to former Speaker DeLeo and now Speaker Mariano. What I can tell you, Mariano, he has been an incredible leader on a host of different issues. And whether you disagree or agree with them, his superpower is his ability to listen and empathize. And I would imagine if you were to talk to legislators across the board and across the region, that many people look up to him as a mentor because he listens and he empathizes, and he has just an understanding of how to get things done. So do you expect things to be substantially different with uh, Speaker Mariano at the at the. Well, look, the first vote we took was a progressive vote to pass climate change legislation. And I expect that moving forward in the next year and a half, uh, or two years, you're going to see more of that. And uh, where, where are you going to put your time if you stay in the state legislature? What, uh, what areas are you going to be your number well, one priority? I, I'm really focused on making sure that COVID-19 is addressed. I mean, there's a acute crisis of COVID right now. There's the testing. There's the vaccination rollout. But I'm really more concerned about what the next two, three, four years look like and how we bring the Commonwealth back. Because to me, that's going to be the challenge and making sure that it's rooted in equity and opportunity across the city and state. Just, and, we've to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Janet. I was just going to ask him one, more, one last question. If you decide to run for mayor, would you continue working as an ER doctor? That's a great question. I think the mayor of Boston is a 24-7 job. Um, you know, I have so much respect for my colleagues in the field. Medicine has taught me so much. You know, why I went into politics was as, as a pr precise uh, reflection of my job in the emergency room, taking their stories to the state house. I think it's just logistically difficult to do to practice medicine, but I'm okay with that. I mean, if the opportunity is there to really change communities and change the city, then I would seriously consider leaving medicine. So, so just, just give us an idea right now, percentage-wise. So, you know, if 100% is your work week, is, is it, what is, what is doctor, what percentage is doctor and what percentage is state? Sure, rate? so just to give you an idea, the average emergency medicine doctor works about three or four, you know, eight to 10 hour shifts a week. Typically I work about half of that. I work every other week during COVID because the needs of the hospital, because people were getting sick, because people needed to be there, I actually doubled my hours in the emergency department while remaining um, active on Beacon Hill. I did that during the first surge. Mm -hmm. I, I subsequently got deployed for a couple months. I came back on the 15th of December, got my shots and I've been in the fight uh, this whole time during the second surge and still busy on Beacon Hill. You, you, you got deployed where? I got deployed to Kuwait. Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for, and you've gotten both shots and you're, you're even beyond that. Uh, that I, I got my second shot on January 6th and Good. I did have a couple of, just to let folks know that I did have some, uh, you know, some chills um, after that, but that lasted momentarily and that's to be expected. But to me, that's just telling me that my immune system is, is working mm -hmm. and that I'm going to be protected moving forward. Um, Ed, do you think we've ever had a guest that wears so many hats? Oh, my heavens, right? <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. Thank you on all fronts. Dr. Rep. John Santiago, it's great to have you with us.